Bob, what do you make of what Christine Lagarde has done? What do you make of what Angela Merkel has done? How big an impact is it going to have on the European economy? Boy, uh, Guy, just such a, such a series of, of, of actions from the announcement earlier as well of the recovery fund, um, $750 billion. Uh, Germany today talking about $130 billion in fiscal stimulus. Uh, the addition to the uh, monetary programs announced by President Lagarde this morning, all of them unequivocally positive uh, directionally. Um, and, you know, I would come back. Uh, particularly to the to the fiscal measures. I know President Lagarde has been calling for fiscal measures. Uh, many people have. Um, it's been a little bit like waiting for Godot. 21 years ago, the euro was was uh, you know came and the dream of a big liquid capital market uh, similar to the dollar market or the U.S. market. And this is really uh, for the first time we're seeing some real action around um, fiscal movements. So um, the, the recovery, uh, $750 billion from the recovery fund, and then today uh, Germany announcing $130 billion for Germany, these are very, very positive. Did I, you, you seem to be implying, Bob, that we are finally starting down the road of, of some sort of pooling of, of responsibility and risk here in Europe. I, Germany clearly has had a, a kind of road to Damascus moment here. Angela Merkel in the back end of her career as Chancellor is making a big change. At Christmas the Germans wouldn't spend, now they are. Covid has changed that. Do you think ultimately that is the direction of travel here? That once the Germans have moved that actually the pooling of risk is possible uh, and that dream of that kind of unified uh, European Eurozone response is actually possible? Dare we say it, Guy, as I said, it's a bit like waiting for Godot. It's been a long time since we've seen something. But we also have to keep in mind that for final approval of that $750 billion, it takes a positive vote from each and every one of the 27 states. So um, this, is, uh, this is an incredibly important moment. It's a start. But what an incredibly positive start for in this, in this trying time of COVID-19 but also Europe was hit earlier than the U.S. Their economy was hit earlier. They bottomed a little bit earlier. But the recovery has been very, very tepid. And President Lagarde has been calling for actions like this from the beginning. And if we can get um, um, this um, fiscal reaction from the 27 countries on an integrated basis, and keep in mind that the financing for this $750 billion will be through EU bonds. So it really is an all for one and one for all. And it's, it's, if we can complete on this, um, it's unequivocally positive. So full disclosure, waiting for Godot is my least favorite play on the planet. So I would want to run from that. But does this make you want to buy uh, <laughs> investments in Europe in a different way than you have before? I know you were interested in things like Greece and Italy, but does this sort of up the ante of what you want to be looking into? Yeah, you know, um, Alex, it's very interesting, particularly when you look at the financial services sector. Um, one can argue that, you know, maybe some of the U.S. financial institutions are stronger, healthier, better capitalized versus some of the Europeans. But on the other hand, when you look at the valuations, the valuations in Europe are so low in the case of banks as a price to book um, and uh, in uh, other areas in terms of the multiple of earnings. Europe provides a significant opportunity. As you know, we recently invested in Kepler Chevro, a Paris-based broker-dealer. And they are showing that there are ways for European institutions, in this case, not a bank holding company, not a deposit-taking institution, but Kepler Chevro works with banks such as uh, Unicredit, such as uh, Credit Agricole, uh, and is competing with the U.S. bulge bracket firms in European equity, sales, trading, execution, research. So there are models that can work effectively. And I do think this will encourage us to, uh, to look for more opportunities in Europe, yes. So how do you understand, then, 
that thesis versus still the headlines that we're seeing, like Christine Lagarde did not seem positive about inflation or growth. Uh, the massive riots here, the unrest, I mean, living in the U.S. now is very difficult to, to absorb all of this, but markets just literally don't seem to care. I mean, NASDAQ 100 hit a record high yesterday. What's your, is that all central banks? Like, is that Christine Lagarde? Uh, is that Jay Powell? Is that what they're doing? Well, let's, let's keep in mind that, that, as I said, Europe, uh, the economy was probably hit a little bit earlier. And as unequivocally positive as it is for uh, President Lagarde to be adding $600 billion to the 750 that they've already announced and extending it for a year, the truth is that absolutely pales in comparison to what the Fed has done, both in terms of speed. The Fed moved much more quickly in terms of size. Um, the Fed has really put no caps. The Bank of Japan has put no caps where there are size limitations uh, uh, within Europe and also the breadth uh, uh, of the action. So uh, if, you, if you're taking a balanced look at the Fed actions, Bank of Japan actions and the ECB actions, while they're unequivocally positive, they're probably also lagging some of the other economies. And I would expect there to be a continued spread between the economic recovery in Europe versus that in the U.S. because of the, the Fed and the, and the fiscal actions in terms of their speed and size. Well, just, just picking up on part of what Alex just said, though, do you, is it OK that financial markets are rallying in the way that they are at the moment, given what is happening in the real world? I, be it COVID-19 or the race riots that are taking place in the United States. Does this reflect well on the financial sector? We could all understand the logic behind it. I, markets are not moral creations. But nevertheless, I, the, the, the gap between reality and financial markets seems to be growing every day. Is that OK? Well, I would say it this way. All, all of us are struggling, Guy, to, to try and, uh, you know, figure out the answer to that. The, the way I think about it is this, um, you know, is, is, a, uh, is, is, a, is a former um, uh, trader myself in the financial markets, one always learned to follow the Fed. And what the Fed is doing is having a huge impact on the financial markets. Let's step away from the financial markets and think about the underlying economy. This number, you know, there's so many numbers on unemployment, it can drive people crazy. But the simplicity of it to me is in April, there were 20 million fewer people employed in the United States than in March. 20 million fewer people net, additions, subtractions, simple. The biggest month prior to that was less than a million. And in May, it's going to be another 5 to 10 million. So this 25 to 30 million net jobs lost in the U.S., these people are not going to have jobs next month or the month after. This is going to take a while for this, for this to, to work itself out. So as positive as those uh, actions, both on the monetary and fiscal side are, we do have to deal with the reality that through April and May, we're going to have 25 to 30 million fewer people employed in the U.S. Uh, than in March. And do, do you think financial markets are reflecting that? Um, I think that the economic recovery in the U.S. Uh, will be clearly uh, positively impacted by what the Fed's doing and what the Treasury's doing. But I think the recovery will take longer, be more jagged, be more selective. And I just can't imagine that it, we're not going to struggle to get the unemployment rate from what looks like it's going to be 18 to 20 percent, um, uh, you know, after the announcements later in the week, uh, back to more normalized levels. So I think this yeah. is going to be, you know, I think I think the thought of a V-shaped recovery is just not not credible. So. Bob, the, the backdrop of all of that is the longer it takes, the more the Fed's going to be involved. Um, many think that they're exacerbating and created the massive inequality that we're seeing also play out in the race riots here in the U.S. Is this just a circle? The more they're in it, the worse it gets, et cetera? Well, you know, I'm a financial services expert, so I'll, I'll relate it to financial services. One of the things we're seeing in the U.S., which we've seen in Europe for a while, is with all of these activities, the large financial institutions, insurance companies and banks, are becoming more interconnected and more intertwined 
with their government. And it could be the implementation of Fed programs. It's the willingness of the regulators to raise capital um, when times are good or to reduce capital needs when they have public policy initiatives that want uh, access to the markets. And I'm not making a value judgment of whether it's right or wrong. It's clearly necessary right now. But these things never reverse themselves completely. And so the larger financial institutions uh, have much more of a concentration of risk than they've ever had before. And the largest financial institutions uh, in the U.S. have more of a correlation of risk with the underlying economy. And that's a little bit of a potential for an all chips on black, which is if there's more of a correlation of risk in the domestic market, then as the economy mm -hmm. goes, the health of, of the institutions and NPLs. So I do think these things have unintended consequences. And I think one of the unintended consequences is, and we've seen this in, in, in France for a while, uh, we've certainly seen it across Europe since the financial mm -hmm. crisis in 08 and 09, is, is the financial large national financial institutions have become more interconnected and more intertwined with, with the national governments.